This is a Digital Music Trends episode 158 on the 20th of November 2013. Coming up on the show, Gaga's album release, Deezer's latest news, YouTube's Fun Finder initiative, Rap Genius starts content deals, Mixcloud launches a revamped Android app, and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Lunelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And the MT is available as a podcast uh, on audio and video uh, on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. To get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at Digital Music Trends or email us on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And this week's show comes after a week's break that I took while I was having some time off in China and so there's a a lot to catch up on and helping me break down the news this week and also helping me with my uh, jet lag this week uh, are uh, three great guests uh, starting with David Riley from uh, Good Lizard Media and Signature Brew. So hey David and uh, how's things today? Oh, I'm good thanks yeah thanks so much for having me on. And it's great to have you and uh, as you mentioned earlier uh, you are in, in the middle of a, a brewing session so uh, you are... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if if uh, beer starts to to pour up to this sort of level, I might I might have to leave. But that's, uh, apart that's an, from that, we're all good. <laughs> that's an okay type of flood, though, isn't it? <laughs> it, it could be worse. <laughs> It's a good flood. Uh, and uh, also today we have Jay Herskowitz, uh, developer from New York City, where he works on a bunch of music tech uh, related projects, including cross, um, I can't even speak today, uh, cross platform open source project uh, Tomahawk. Uh, so, hey, Jay, how's it going? Good, good to see you again. Yeah, it's great to have you. And finally, we have Darren Hemmings, a founder of music marketing consultancy Motive Unknown, uh, that works with uh, many great artists and labels, and also uh, he pens the Daily Digest, which is a great uh, resource for keeping up with the uh, uh, news in the music and technology industries every day. So, hey, Darren, how's it going? Good, thank you. Nice to be back. It's great to have you on. And uh, so today uh, we're going to dive straight in, and we're going to talk about Lady Gaga. Let's start with a big pop uh theme to just uh, wake myself up. Uh, so <laughs> she appears to have generated hundreds of headlines with her latest release, uh, Art Pop, uh, but not all of them are positive. So first things first, uh, the album was preceded by a huge amount of press and publicity as expected from such a major universal music release. Uh, Interscope has been rumored to have spent uh, somewhere in the region of $25 million on the release. Uh, and uh, Gaga started the major push for the album on the 1st of September when she performed at the iTunes Festival just around the corner from here at the Roundhouse in London, um, and where she performed a few of the tracks, uh, and uh, then it continued uh, relentlessly for the uh, for the next uh, two and a bit months, uh, uh, finishing with the with the Saturday Night Live uh, spot uh, in the States uh, last week. Um, so you know, uh, alongside the app, uh, the album, there's an app uh, which is uh, for iPad and iOS devices, which is uh, interesting, but it doesn't do anything you know crazy. But it's it's, it's quite a uh, intensive treatment of the album in a sort of app uh, uh, sen- uh, setting uh, and uh, apparently the album is not selling particularly great uh, but it is uh, heading to towards a number one both in the US and in the UK. Uh, so the, the big news that came out earlier this month is that Gaga is uh, due to split with her manager uh, Troy Carter, uh, her longtime manager that sort of guided her uh, to where she is uh, today. And uh, it's, it's unclear really why the split happened. But, uh, for, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you guys uh, sort of uh, what do you think about uh, the art pop campaign? Uh, do you feel like uh, uh, it was as good uh, on a digital front as it could have been? Have you seen any uh, anything missing from it? Uh, or is it just the, the best campaign that it could have, could have been done uh, at this stage? Uh, Darren, what, what are your thoughts? Um, it feels to me a little bit like it came up short. I mean, I, I think it's, it's that funny thing, isn't it? I mean, I, I suspect a lot of people are going to weigh in with opinions and tell everybody why it failed and who's responsible and, and all that kind of stuff. But I suspect part of the problem, to be blunt, is that people are just a, probably a little bit over her at the moment. And, you know, the reasons for that are probably more interesting than the reasons for the, uh, you know, if you, you'd, you'd be better off dissecting the reasons why that's happened as the (laughs) reason why the marketing campaign is not doing so well so but it feels like to me it just wasn't uh, you know she wasn't as maybe as visible I don't know it's kind of a weird one I mean sort of on paper you can tick off a bunch of boxes saying all right she did Saturday Night Live and she did the iTunes Festival but none of it seemed to carry that kind of weight of anticipation and excitement about it so it just feels to me as I said, I think you know there seems to be a lot of mud flying on this one. There's sort of all kinds of places in the states, you know, where sources are being quoted and all this kind of tabloid randomness that goes on. Um, 
but I, you know, I suspect that the predominant thing is just that people are over it. So, I mean, it, you know, I think it's that classic thing where people follow up a, you know, a big release, and inevitably the one following it tends to be a bit of a, a sort of, you know, a letdown. I suppose, you know, it just it hasn't, you know, I mean, people are saying, you know, Born This Way sold a million copies, and and Art Pop has only sold a quarter of a million, which, uh, yeah. you know, is something of a fall, I suppose, but. You know, the more interesting bit was Troy Carter going. It seems a little bit unclear as to why that's happened. Uh, there's a bit of sort of he said, she said antics going on as to whether he walked out or whatever. But I kind of agree with what uh, Eamon Ford, who's been on this show a few times before now, said, which was that, you know, with all bands, when the one person uh, who's there to tell you, you know, to say no uh, is removed from the equation, then broadly speaking, you tend to be in quite a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, you know, and this guy's been with her from the start, and uh, you know the fact that he's now no longer there could mean that she might v- vanish <laughs> up her own backside in in record time. We'll see, but yeah, uh, yeah I think it, more than anything, I think while people love to break this stuff down, I think part of it is just that people are a bit over gargoyles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Jay, uh, f- in your perspective, is it crazy to see figures uh, banded around like this? Even if the figure that is uh, is real is only half of the amount that was reported, it's still a huge amount of money for a label to bet on artists. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it kind of felt like we're over that type of spending from from majors, but uh, it doesn't look like we are. Uh, you know, how do you feel about it? Do you feel like uh, that there is there are still a number of campaigns that are being run as huge bets, a bit like a blockbuster movie? And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Uh, I mean, you know, I feel like that's that is the business of the majors. It's a yeah. blockbuster driven business, so they need to make sure that the blockbusters happen. Um, you know why? You know, to Darren's point, why this hasn't yet happened, I I don't really know. Uh, in terms of the visibility, you know, sample set of one, I've seen almost none of Gaga uh, over this kind of campaign. Um, although I don't know exactly what channels she would be able to reach me on, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it it could just be that, you know, the hits aren't there. Uh, you know, I certainly have gotten lots of Katy Perry and lots of One Direction exposure over the last couple of days, uh, you know, or weeks when it comes to pop. So I don't know why um, why Gaga hasn't kind of resonated yet. But it's but, uh, but I do think that, you know, the blockbusters have to happen and, and you know, the majors need to make these blockbusters happen to, to, to fund the rest of the business. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I think you'll see big bets. Yeah, and uh, and uh, David, let's talk about the app as well. Like uh, uh, that was was seen as a centerpiece of the campaign, at least when uh, Gaga announced the uh, art pop. Uh, uh, but I, I'm not really sure how well it's performing, or uh, you know, the, the app is okay. It's got like a whole very intricate uh, uh, intro where she sort of guides you through discovering your aura, and then uh, you can browse through the tracks. But there's not a whole amount you can do if you haven't actually uh, bought the album uh, before, anyway. So uh, I don't know. Do you feel like uh, this is kind of a death knell for uh, artist-based album apps, or you know, is there more that can be done to explore that that scenario? I think the one thing it achieved that I haven't seen uh, achieved before is uh, actually having some good presentation and, yeah. and that presentation following through. Um, like the startup, the, the way it's all set about and set up was felt like an immersive process where usually it feels like a lot of apps that are created with artists and around albums feel like, oh, and we should do an app. This felt much more integrated into campaign, which is, which is great. But uh, unless with it, unless you're a really big Gaga fan, like I've been playing it for a while and it's really not interesting for me. And you know, the concept of an aura just, I mean, it goes way, way beyond, <laughs> way, way over my head. But um, uh, in terms of this, in terms of this whole campaign, what the guys were saying before, I think that judging a, a successful Lady Gaga campaign in, in terms of album sales is, is selling it a little bit short. Um, a successful campaign for Lady Gaga, the album is the centerpiece for her promotional peak, as it were. And there's a lot. She has had a lot, an awful lot of visibility in in some of the right areas. She's been able to create a new uh, a new period in her campaign, which is this whole art pop thing. And the whole campaign has made has has, has been there to um, to push her into a fuller art world, which she can explore going forward. So I think in in some ways it's been quite successful. Right. Um, although the album sales haven't haven't borne that out yet. Yeah, and, and some, some people have also written that uh, it's actually the album sales are actually pretty good considering that none of the singles have been blockbusters. So the fact that she still managed to get a number one in both the UK and the US, even if the sales are not quite the ones that they used to be, uh, given that there's no bad romance or uh, you know uh, poker face, it's, it's still a pretty good achievement. 
yeah, yeah um, so yeah uh, that's an interesting story but uh, you know I, I think you know it is a successful al- album launch we, you know, we can't really completely uh, disregard it as a, as a failure because it's a number one album but it's just uh, uh, to the extent that this amount of money might have been spent on it then of course you know the finding a way to recoup that is it becomes a whole lot harder uh, than it would have been otherwise uh, and uh, uh, I wanted to move on from uh, Gaga and talk about Deezer. We don't talk about Deezer uh, that much on the show, uh, but uh, the company finally had some big news uh, to announce. And so the, the um, CEO, Axel Dorsche, uh, did a, a live stream keynote about 10 days ago. I, I, was, I was away at the time. And uh, Deezer reported uh, having now 5 million uh, paying subscribers, which is more than double what it had a year ago, and 12 million monthly active users. Uh, so that's a quite an interesting proportion there between uh, what are the monthly active users and what are the paying subscribers, because it's almost uh, 50% uh, of, of the monthly active users are uh, essentially paying subscribers uh, and uh, uh, it, you know the, the company is uh, seems to do pretty well it's got 25 telco deals worldwide and is focusing on uh, focusing on strengthening its uh, local catalogs in order to deliver uh, the right catalog- catalogs to the 180 plus countries that it's present in so uh, you know it also announced a couple of new discovery features one called here this uh, and the other called explore which are targeted specifically at mobile users because of 75 percent of the streams happening on Deezer are from mobile uh, and uh, in, so you know a bunch of uh, interesting news coming out of of, uh, Deezer. So uh, they also released a new desktop uh, dashboard uh, for Mac, which is a standalone uh, Mac app uh, for, for Deezer users. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm interested in seeing what's going to happen to the company in, in the next year or so. Uh, th- there's also rumors that the company is going to launch in the US. So, uh, uh, David, starting with you, in the UK, it's an interesting uh, uh, you know, perspective because Deezer hasn't really broken through yet, uh, but it has slashed its price uh, to half, so it's only four ninety nine now instead of uh, nine ninety nine like uh, most other services. Uh, do you feel like it has a uh, uh, th- there is a way for Deezer to break through in the UK uh, via pricing or or other ways? Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that the pricing is going to make a huge difference. The way the way it would break in more is with is is with Telco is with having that service um, already part of. Uh, part of uh, mobile contract, etc. Um, yeah. It's a very, very. There's a lot of people in the market at the moment. YouTube's doing very well. I, I, I think they're gonna they're gonna struggle. Audio is not doing too badly. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the service set itself apart enough yet to yeah. warrant it. To warrant the move for the people that are already, you know, myself looked at with Spotify or whatever streaming service you're already using. You really have to go above and beyond. Uh, in terms of the the service that you get and what you can do with with the service, yeah. uh, in order to justify a, a change from one to the other, and I don't I really don't think a five quid difference in 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 a monthly fee is well for, for me certainly won't make any difference at all. Yeah, sure, uh, uh, Darren. On, on uh, keeping on onto the UK sort of European perspective, Deezer of course is doing very well in France. Uh, in the UK, we talked about it before on the show. It's going to be a difficult break, uh, but the five million users uh, outside of the US—that's a pretty interesting figure, just because uh, most users usually are uh, within based within the US. So, do you think that's uh, uh, something that differentiates Deezer from other streaming companies? On the in, in that sense, I mean, certainly they you know they played quite a good strategy by way of launching in all the territories that Spotify wasn't available initially so there was something of a kind of you know international land grab going on between you know Spotify and and Deezer and indeed other services so I mean you know I think they've certainly made headway in select territories but I mean you know it's it's interesting because I think Spotify is kind of clearly out in front it's it feels like it's winning the PR war as much as anything else Um, but I think you know, we're still just, it feels like we're at the thin end of the wedge on this. You know, there are so many people crowding into this marketplace even now, you know, that um, it's it's just tricky to make a call on it really because, you know, as David said, I don't think there's enough to differentiate. And personally, I mean, you know, I got given a free trial on Deezer and I didn't even use that because it was just sort of, there was not enough reason to use it. It was, you know, it didn't have a desktop client at the time, which I think they're now changing. But, you know, it sort of felt to me like on the one hand I had Spotify, which was nice for playlists and for discovery bits, and then you had audio elsewhere that was, you know, a superior user interface and things like that and a bit neater and tidier for me. Yeah. And Deezer yeah. was just sort of neither of the above, which made it particularly kind of tricky to to see any real appeal there. But I suppose in territories where maybe those other services aren't there to present themselves, you know, they can make an initial grab. 
I mean, I think what's interesting as well is just the sheer amount of money being bandied around with these things. You know, I mean, in Deza and, you know, Lem Blavatnik and Access Industries, you know, got some pretty huge backers. And, you know, it's the same with Audio. You know, the owners of Audio got seriously deep pockets. And so <laughs> everyone is prepared to go on the, you know, the long game on this one. And it would be interesting to see. I mean, I think Deza's most interesting move of late was to kind of copy the Google... Uh, uh, you know, cloud storage thing that they reckon they're going to be rolling out soon where you can upload your iTunes library into Deezer and access that as well. I think that is a point of difference that could win people over. But, yeah, I think it feels more like at the moment they're just winning, you know, as our Spotify to some extent on that sort of argument of, like, in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man's king, you know, <laughs> it's sort of doing well in territories where it more or less has no competition. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it's, yeah, it remains to be seen. But right now it just feels like they lack all of the things that other services have got. You know, they don't have the sexy user interface. They don't have the feature set of Spotify, you know, and Google could yet sort of make some interesting moves relative to the YouTube premium account and wrapping that in with Google Music and yeah. all of the other ways in which they can leverage Google Music through their own empire. But first of all, I don't really see where Deezer can stand out. Yeah. And uh, Jay, uh, talking about the US perspective, if the company is to launch in the US and launch in the, in the final major market where it hasn't uh, yet launched because it's uh, very expensive to, to find a user base there as well. So uh, where do you think it could get a user base from? Because I mean, what, I, I believe that now all the telcos in the States have some sort of partnership with a music streaming service. Uh, I, can you see a way in for them? I, I mean, the only in that I could see um, for Deezer in the U.S., which is obviously extremely crowded, and there's you know a half a dozen services that people even forget exist when they're listing them off, um, is the one that Darren talked to, and that's that's this relationship with Access Industries. You know, yeah. Access is the biggest investor in Deezer. They're the biggest investor in Beats, um, and they own Warner Music, right? So if there was some sort of, you know, Deezer is the rest of the world strategy for Beats, or Beats is the U.S. strategy for Deezer, and there was some kind of roll-up between those two, I think that's really interesting because now all of a sudden you can kickstart a global strategy out of the gate um, and leveraging what I can only expect, and I've never seen it, to be a, a, you know, a, a solid user experience from Beats. And I know a bunch of guys that work there. And I really respect the work that they do, so I expect it to be a, you know, a good kind of compelling service. Yeah. So that to me is the most interesting thing. And and you know, um, I was just talking this morning. Beats just had a full page, actually a, a double full page ad of New York Times yesterday saying coming soon. Um, the rumors oh, that they yeah that they were going to partner with AT and T, um, which is all going to be driven by a holiday, you know, kind of marketing strategy around new phones and carrier deals and everything else. Uh, I hope to see something, you know, right after Thanksgiving from Beats, given kind of what's starting to percolate. So um, whether that has anything to do with Deezer or not, I have no idea, but it would be interesting if it did. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, of course, I, I was going to say that I hadn't seen any press of late. I did, I did, I did a couple of searches before the show uh, on Beats and Daisy. There wasn't anything really coming up, uh, even rumors wise. So they've been pretty good at keeping a tight ship on what's going to happen. And uh, whatever launches now is going to be uh, quite a surprise. I mean, aside from all the initial uh, boastfulness and, about what the service would be. Yeah. And as for Deezer, you know, I know what it is. You know, most Americans don't even know what Spotify is. So um, knowing what Deezer is, is, uh, you know, a far stretch. And, and, you know, we can't even see. The only thing we get is, uh, is a splash page if you go to Deezer.com. Right. Saying coming soon to the U.S. So most of us have never even seen it. Uh, Jay, uh, in the U.S., have the uh, TV cable carriers uh, partnered with uh, streaming services yet? So have you seen a Comcast do, do deals yet? There was just a deal um, between Slacker and Time Warner right. um, that was just announced. And these deals actually are not new. They, they were The problem with that deal, with the Slacker-Time Warner deal, is at least what I could read out of the press release was if you go to the Time Warner portal, you know, there's radio powered by Slacker. And A, nobody goes to their cable provider, provider's portal. Um, and these were deals that were tried by you know, Comcast and Rhapsody you know, about 10 years ago, um, and other kind of cable provider ISP portals. And I think the bigger issue is that nobody goes to their ISP's portal for anything. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't expect those to make any kind of, any kind of difference. More interesting, obviously, if they started to bundle full on demand into, um, into your bill, uh, but that obviously needs to be portable and not tied to 
the bits traveling over that ISP's wire. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that could be quite interesting. And uh, moving on to talking about a, a, a smaller company, uh, I wanted to just mention Mixcloud because uh, they have re uh, released uh, uh, their uh, new Android uh, revamped app after a, re a revamp of the iOS app earlier this year, which uh, brought uh, uh, a swathe of new uh, users from the mobile front. So they also revealed that their uh, iOS uh, uh, revamp uh, brought uh, the percentage of uh, listeners on mobile from 10% to 25%, uh, which uh, really signals that things are going in the right direction for the company and uh, they haven't updated the monthly user figures or anything like that with this new release uh, but uh, it's fair to say that with the amount of Android phones out there uh, if the Android release is as good as the uh, iOS release uh, that could really be uh, a great win for the company so uh, how do you guys feel a mixed cloud can position itself right now uh, given all the other streaming services out there, and do you feel like uh, uh, it's got? And when it comes to Jay, do you feel like it's got a shot in the US as well? Uh, 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 Darren, do you want to start with uh, your perspective from a, from a UK point of view of, of where Mixcloud is and, and what <coughs> they can do? I think Mixcloud is is great as a service. I mean, I've used it myself, and when I was doing radio shows, and it was you know, it is a really good um, experience from you know as, as a as a person uploading content to, but also as someone kind of browsing for stuff to listen to. Yeah. You know, I like the model. I think it works very well. Um, it just, I don't know, it feels like it's still a little bit niche to me. I mean, it's, uh, you know, select DJs use it and things like that, but you don't really see so much prominence of it outside of Mixcloud. Like SoundCloud's big win was always as was YouTube, you know, the people were embedding players here, there, and everywhere, and all those sorts of things, and that made it a lot more visible, you know, because it was all over the blogs, all over this, all over that. Yeah. Uh, whereas Mixcloud doesn't seem to happen so much, and I think that's a kind of a big uh, differentiator, you know, when people start sharing these things around and you're seeing them all over the place, whether it's on Facebook or on blogs or Twitter or whatever, you know, all those little spots that they can get themselves mm -hmm. into, then you'd see greater adoption. I mean, it's it is an odd one because you see a lot, you know, I think Ninja Tune use them for Solid Steel and things like that now. You know, there's quite a lot of good stuff on there. And a lot of the hip-hop crowd have really started adopting it. And, you know, the older hip-hop DJs have started rolling out all their old mixes onto things like Mixcloud and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it's it's not quite there, but I think it's still got, a you know, a, a promising future. And, you know, I mean, SoundCloud, I don't think would necessarily openly cop to it, but certainly they're really not wild about having mixes on their service. It's not really in their you know, remit to have them on there. It represents a little bit of a copyright liability and all those kinds of things. So yeah. it's actually quite a nice happy medium between the two that I think could be found, you know, but yeah. it's just getting that visibility up so that people see it as something that they can easily access and adopt. Um, and it's just all those little things, you know, where if, you know, Mixcloud, you know, they should be looking at a Sonos app and things like that. Now that Sonos is making a big, you know, budget play with the Play 1s and Play 3s and suddenly it's all, you know, for the realm of the common man, not the ludicrously wealthy audio files, then uh, you know all of those things can sort of Trojan horse your service in, and I think those are the kind of things that do well to be looking at now. But yeah. you know, I think it's great. I, I love the service. I've used it. I think it's brilliant. Um, but it just hasn't quite managed that that tipping point, you know, where suddenly everyone's making use of it. Yeah, yeah, David. David, have you used it uh, yourself as part of? You work with a few electronic artists as well, like Lizard. Uh, have you ever used it uh, uh, in that context? And and uh, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I've used it. To be honest, using mix mix has been used yeah. more more often recently, especially with the smaller artists I work with, because a lot of them want to do mixes. They want to do mixtapes and put them up. But SoundCloud have tightened right down on their um, the usage of other people's content on, uh, in SoundCloud and in mixes. That quite often those mixtapes won't will not be allowed by SoundCloud, sure. and a lot of people are then move, moving to Mixcloud in, to enable them to do it. Yeah. Uh, in, t in terms of Mixcloud, as a uh, for certain niches of music, it's a good place. It's a really good place to be for discovery. So putting those artists in there and being able to discover as part of the community, but. Um, apart from that, not not a huge not a huge part of the marketing mix. Sorry for the pun. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, but in terms of them competing with Spotify or, or whoever else, the one thing they have is really really good uh, curation. They have the best curation of not of music necessary, but of uh, a half an hour's listen or an hour's listen. Yeah. That's what they really have above everybody else. Um, uh, um, but that's it. I mean, great service, but. Yeah, not quite, not quite there yet. 
It's interesting, um, you know, uh, and also for the benefit of the listeners, in case they weren't that familiar with the, with the service, you know, the differentiator between, uh, you know, for example, Mixcloud, between Mixcloud and Soundcloud is that Mixcloud operates on a uh, internet radio license, essentially, so they can, uh, they have a license, uh, you know, to uh, broadcast uh, c copyrighted music as long as it's part of a playlist uh, and it's not uh, sort of on-demand listening. Uh, and so, on th that front, that's why they can have mixes on the, on the site, while SoundCloud can't because they don't have uh, that type of license uh, from, from the PRS, at least in the UK. So, uh, an interesting, uh, you know, different approach. Uh, and also, of course, Mixcloud doesn't have direct licenses with the content owners. It operates on a blanket license with the PRS so that they don't, they're not able to uh, uh, broadcast uh, individual tracks, of course. Uh, and uh, Jay, uh, from your perspective, have you have you heard uh, rumblings around Mixcloud in the US? I know they have quite a large user base, but they don't have yet uh, offices set up, uh, at least not yet, as far as I know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, you hear people that are fans of specific genres um, that will use uh, Mixcloud far often, uh, far more often than kind of your, you know, your general average listener. From the mass market <laughs> perspective, it's not really a, a service you hear people talk about, at least not in the circles that I hang out in. But then again, I'm, I don't generally listen uh, to mixtapes um, or you know or radio shows or, or those things. So yeah. um, you know, I think it's found a nice little niche that they can operate in. Um, uh, whether it's got the legs to be you know really mass market service that competes at the scale of like a SoundCloud or YouTube or something else, I think uh, you know that's. It's definitely going to be complicated because they're trying to split the difference, to your point, between those services which have mass market adoption and then, you know, on kind of the radio side, um, you know, Pandora and, and songs uh, here in the U.S., I don't know how it does internationally, uh, yeah. and obviously iTunes Radio, those things are, are kind of squeezing them from the other side. So yeah. I think there's an opportunity in there, but I think it's kind of contained. Yeah, sure, of course. It's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, I think, to be honest, there's... Like, I mean, so I used to do radio shows, and one thing that always annoyed me was that nobody's really nailed me very competent. So with all of this stuff, it's kind of like you're not getting a seamless thing whereby you can broadcast and then archive a bit and make it available. And um, I think Mixcloud, could, you know, it could be an interesting area for them. Uh I want to talk about YouTube. I know, uh, Darren, you, uh, you talked about it on the Digest as well. And YouTube has uh, had some interesting news that I think is going to impact uh, uh, all of us that work in music marketing uh, and uh, uh, myself as well. I'm going to have to create one of these uh, uh, things uh, too. And uh, it launched a new Find Finder initiative, which allows the channel owners to create a short video ad to promote their content uh, and find new fans. Uh, so this will be shown as a true view of video, which is the one you can skip after five seconds. And apparently YouTube is going uh, going to offer that uh, promotion for free and it's going to match uh, uh, you know your channel with potential viewers that might also want to subscribe so it's a way to get more subscribers it's, it's a way to get more fans for musicians and hopefully uh, also dmt is going to benefit if we find more people that are interested in uh, uh, this uh, sort of thing uh, sort of thing that we're talking about today so uh, uh, darren I'll, I'll start with you because you, you wrote a, quite a, a long paragraph on it on the digest uh, you know how do you feel that positions youtube as a, a tool for uh, musicians and and, uh, uh, are you excited about trying this out? Um, well, in terms of trying it out, um, yeah, I mean, it's a nice feature, but I did find myself looking at it and thinking, if you're turning this on for everyone, then it sort of immediately ceases to be special. <laughs> because, you know, how many channels are on YouTube and how many people are going to try and use it? And sure enough, I did turn it on and I went back five days later and the number of views that my my ad had had on my not inconsiderable channel was zero. So oh. uh, it's a bit weird. I don't know. I mean, I am a bit cynical, and I do wonder if there is a slightly ulterior motive to YouTube turning this on, uh, because it doesn't really make a lot of sense to them to say, hey, we're going to chip into all of our ad inventory by running these ads for free. <laughs> for free, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, let, let's give them the, you know, it's a good, it's a good function, and, it, it, you know, if the uh, ads get run, then, you know, that's great. And, uh, I mean, I do like the idea that they're sort of giving an opportunity to run a, an intro, to, you know, an advert-type clip. I mean, if you look at, you know, the labels running to sort of best practice, like hospital records, things like that, you know, they've got these kind of trailers when you land on their channel that show what they're about. And I would imagine that that is, you know, in hospital's case, going to be the thing that they would pick to advertise themselves. And I've just done the same with one of my clients, Houndstooth, which is Fabrics label, you know, same yeah. thing, very much a trailer for the label and, and that sort of stuff. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I think on the on a broader level, it's what's more interesting is that you know it feels like YouTube isn't perhaps getting as much recognition as it should as as like for the volume of tools that they're providing for artists now. I mean, they've you know, very slowly introduced a lot of things, which in the context of them ultimately becoming the next streaming service is really interesting because you know the fact that. Just on a base level, if you're going to say, well, YouTube will become a streaming service akin to Spotify and Co., and, and really I think we could probably all say that actually it is that already, then the fact that I can add things like annotations to link back to, you know, to upsell, whether it's merch, you know, tickets or, you know, uh, the release itself, things like that, or you can, you know, you can, you can control what's displayed on there and all those sorts of things. Puts them streets ahead of something like Spotify, where I've got absolutely zero control over. You know, any means there is no means to communicate with yeah. people while they're um, listening to my music, except to make more music, which is not really the, the the idea. So, you know, I just think it's it's been interesting for me purely because everyone's looking at beats, going, "Oh, it's amazing! They're gonna they're gonna upsell stuff for artists," and you're sort of looking at YouTube, going, "Well, does that anyway?" I mean, immediately, yeah. I, you know. Beats will doubtless have to pay more per stream, and there's all kinds of other financial bits that we could discuss around this. But yeah, I just think it's interesting that YouTube is continuing to try and just provide more and more tools that that work. And at the moment, you know, I tend to lean more towards using YouTube than SoundCloud for precisely that reason. That you know, it's easier to you know if people are uh, you know blogs are writing about my band and they're posting the video even if it's a static clip and you put a decent slide on there with, you know, a, a buy on iTunes button or a subscriber, you know, any of those sorts of things, then yeah. or at least it just feels like you've got more control and more flexibility in what you can do. So, yeah, yeah I just think it's, um, you know, it seems to be shaping up quite well at the moment. I'm quite a fan. Jay, I, I wanted to uh, turn the tables around a little bit. Like, so uh, why would YouTube offer this? Like, uh, as, uh, as Darren mentioned, it's a bit weird that they would offer this uh, sort of free ad inventory to every single channel on YouTube. So the, the, the options are, A, they're really nice and they just want to do this out of the goodness of their own hearts. Uh, B, there is some sort of issue uh, with uh, uh, smaller channels being able to gain traction or gain new uh, followers because there's some discover the discovery issues within within the YouTube platform. Uh, C consumers themselves are, are finding hard to find related content that they that they really love, and so YouTube wants to give uh, them a way in by matching them with the channels that they might like. D you know, are any of those options feasible for you? Uh, all of them? <laughs> I, I mean, it certainly could be any mix of them. Yeah. You know, my first reaction to it is they're competing for ad dollars against Twitter and Facebook. Um, right, and Twitter gave us, you know, was given out 25 bucks or 50 bucks worth of, you know, uh, credits, and Facebook gave that out too. And so I just think that the number of channels where advertisers are spending their money is getting much more competitive. Yeah. And I think they're just trying to remind everybody, hey, you know, come spend your money with us too. Um, but, you know, the other pieces I'm sure are all parts of it. But, but you know, I think, um, you know, there's only there's only so much of uh, there's only so many dollars to go around, and and as uh, bigger guys come up, um, you know, it's all trying to get a piece of the same pie. So yeah, I guess, and I guess uh, David, I guess it's also a way for them to get people to try out the advertising system, right? If if they say it's a free campaign, they might get people involved into the advertising side of things that wouldn't have ototherwise run a campaign on the YouTube advertising platform. And after they do that and they see maybe a little bit of engagement on that front, maybe they will actually start advertising and paying some money uh, towards having adverts on YouTube. That, does that sound, sound feasible-ish? It sounds, it sounds exactly right. It's, it's a complete win. It's an all-round win for YouTube. They have yeah. more interesting adverts that, um, you know, that, that, that customers don't hugely like, but if they're making interesting adverts with channels that's, that's not you know, some... Uh, car company or someone else that, that, that people don't want on their channel. It's interesting adverts. It gets um, more people to try out more niche channels and get them to subscribe, which is great for them. Uh, it gives a little bit back. gives a good feeling back to to YouTube content creators, uh, and um, it's you know it's just a classic classic. Give someone a little bit of something, and they and it succeeds, and then they want more of it. It's um, all round. I, I you know, it, I think it works for everybody. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same as the fifty quid free you know, Facebook ads or fifty quid Google ads or whatever else that that's given away. You're exactly right. Like it's 
Uh, well, I think it works for everybody, really. It's a way in. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, staying with you just uh, for a second, I wanted to talk about Twitter because uh, Jay mentioned it briefly. And uh, Twitter launched, uh, it sort of uh, opened up its advertising platform for SMEs and small and medium enterprises in the UK and Ireland uh, last week, uh, which is interesting because it means that uh, you know the the a thousand pound barrier thing that was uh that was the the minimum spend before is has been uh, abolished and uh, any, anybody can advertise on twitter i mean i had a quick play around with it and uh, the interesting thing was that they recommended a minimum spend per uh, follow of uh, a pound which is super high uh so i just wanted to ask you what, what are your thoughts from a digital marketing perspective and i'll ask darren as well uh, on twitter advertising is it something that you feel artists uh, might benefit from is it too expensive what's happening there uh f from my from my experience of it there's a lot of people now want the artists that are represented from from more ma from a management side rather than from 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 the label side there's a lot of people coming to us saying right we want to we want to promote this tweet if you're tweeting about this we want to promote it and from that side it's been a really like the, the lowering of the barrier means a lot more people want to do it and then we kind of um it's, it's working out well in that other people are spending money to promote our tweets, which is which is fantastic. Um, I haven't done a lot. I haven't done any of the other side going promoting something from an artist themselves, yeah. um, just with people coming to us. Um, I, uh, but for that, it's regardless of uh, I'd rather not have followers and rather have people see the content. Yeah. Um, that wouldn't be really the point of if it was going to run one for me of getting more Twitter followers it would be to spike out a, a piece of information a link or, or a piece of content rather than um, you know I, I don't really want a follower based on one tweet not exactly um, yeah. so uh, one tweet that, that's unsolicited so it's kind of the be probably a shitty follower as well that wouldn't return, in terms of they'd probably tweet really badly they'd probably tweet out their cats and their pet no there'd be um no, it'd be, it'd be people that, that that wouldn't represent a good return return on investment yeah. um, f from doing that. So, uh, yeah, that's really. Yeah, uh, Darren, do you agree with uh, David? You know, a, a good way of spreading content uh, around. Uh, yeah, if some other sucker's paying for it. I mean, I've been <laughs> <laughs> I've been running them. I have to say, since the thing went self serve, I mean, obviously I ran them. You know, they've, they've run them before on campaigns where we put down about two and a half grand on spend and. Um, with mixed results, but we sort of came out of it thinking, well, you know, it wasn't, it, we we're kind of on the fence, I think, basically. One campaign went very well, and another one didn't really do a great deal. But since it switched to self serve, I've run a few tests with campaigns. And um, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's just sort of highlighted how good Facebook has become as an ad platform. Um, there's a number of problems with this. I mean, you know, as you mentioned, they're, they're, suggested cost per engagement which is a key word to remember um is like around a pound which in my book like a pound for doing anything around my tweet is way too much you know way too much and there's no fucking way i'm paying a pound for you to do anything with my artist it's just bananas so um you know and, and also i just found that the you know facebook for better or worse gives you a huge amount of insight you can't say that facebook doesn't give you enough info because now they really do, and, and to their credit, they're really trying to innovate and make it even clearer so you know exactly what's going on around your stuff. And if after that you're still running crappy ads, well, then it's kind of down to you, you know. Whereas with Twitter, it's very woolly. It's, you know, everything is just engagements. Well, of course, on any tweet, there's numerous ways to engage, and I think even expanding the tweet to, to kind of see the media card and things like that, um, that all counts. And so to pay a pound for that is, is totally insane. Um, and it just isn't, you know, it's not granular enough. Um, so when I've been running them, it's all it's done is just made Facebook look like phenomenally good value in terms of driving any kind of call to action. And it's annoying because in truth, I think Twitter's got particularly around radio one and things like that. If you're on radio one and you've been playlisted and everything else, it makes a huge amount of sense to run Twitter ads on there. Because there is this kind of mildly unholy triangle between Radio One, Twitter, and YouTube, and you know it, it, it would make a lot of sense to to work that platform. And you know, Twitter is very real time advertising, so it would be good to know that you could take all your money and really focus it into that kind of whatever sixty minute period when yeah. your artist yeah. is on Radio One doing a session or or whatever, you know. And for that it could work really well. But when the cost per engagements are, are so high, I mean, after you know, numerous efforts to optimize mine. Um, the, the lowest I got it down to was about 70p. 
per engagement, which certainly didn't leave anyone on my team looking at it and feeling really good about it. <laughs> um, it sure. You know, it just it didn't it didn't really amount to much. So. But, you know, it's early days, and I think that there were the same sort of teething problems with Facebook originally, and, you know, they're not stupid. They know how this goes, and it will it will doubtless optimize out, uh, you know, over time, and they'll, you know, as, as Jay said earlier, really, you know, there's a lot of competition now for that money. Um, and so, you know, my initial conclusions really are, uh, are that at this point, it feels like the costs to engage are not within the average campaign budget in yeah. music. Yeah. If you're a brand where you can sit there and, and afford one pound per engagement, and that's you know doesn't they wouldn't have like a manager vaulting the desk to punch you in the face, then you know that would be great. But in music, a pound per engagement, particularly if you're trying to sell a single at seventy nine p, is just you know totally ridiculous. Insane. Yeah, yeah. So it's but give it time. You know, I think it, it's got every opportunity to fill a really great space as a real time advertising platform but just at this point um like i said it, it really highlights how good facebook has become where on paper you know even when you weed it down to the cost per link to you know click on a link to buy yeah. given there's a whole raft of false positives in facebook ads like you know clicking like clicking comment when really you might just be paying because what you want to do is drive sales for views or whatever um you know even when you boil it down to that that's still well below 80p you know it's yeah. normally well below 40 or 50p if you're doing it right so uh, it just doesn't compare and at the end of the day when there's not a vast amount of money to throw around uh, you're going to sit there and just ask the question well where am i seeing the best return on my investment <laughs> Absolutely. And it's not on twitter so uh, and, and jay uh, uh, from your perspective do you feel like uh, a twitter Uh, is not, uh, you know, from a developer's sort of perspective as well. I know that Twitter has got a, a lot of data, really, from, from its funnel. You can get a lot more data than is, is visible uh, concerning all sorts of things, uh, including geolocation and uh, more personal information, all, all sorts of stuff, really. Uh, do you feel like uh, that stuff that's going to be revealed, like Darren says, in, in the future as part of the advertising package as, as it becomes more granular and more useful, hopefully? Oh, I'm sure. I mean, you know, the amounts of data that they collect about what you view, what you like, what songs you're sharing, you know, whether it be directly from Twitter Music or from the other apps, you know, the amount of data that they have is immense. So uh, absolutely, I think they're going to get much more uh, intelligent about how to target that stuff. And, and I would expect big things. I think, I think Darren's right. I think this is early days and, you know, they're just uh, getting going with this. But uh Yeah, there's going to be some really powerful stuff that comes out of that, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, talking about uh, uh, startups uh, in uh, the US, I wanted to talk about Rap Genius for uh, a few minutes. So uh, Rap Genius is a, a very interesting site. It's based in uh, Brooklyn, so it's uh, close to you, uh, Jay. And uh, it's uh, you know one of the hot music startups, I guess, from, from New York City. Uh, it's uh, all about uh, hip-hop lyrics uh, for the most part, although there's all sorts of lyrics in it, really. Uh, and it's about hip-hop lyrics and The, the analysis of those lyrics by the community and so uh, the company has got, got a 15 million round uh, last year I think last October uh, and uh, it's, it was started in 2009 and so far hadn't uh, closed any content licensing deals for the lyrics that it has on the site so of course that had uh, angered the NMPA the National Music Publishers Association which had uh, uh, started a takedown motion against uh, the company uh, but uh, after the uh, Rap Genius announced uh, a deal with the Sony ATV uh, um, last week, uh, the NMPA withdrew. It uh, has withdrawn its uh, its uh, uh, motion, at least temporarily, until they get to talk with Rap Genius a little bit more. So, uh, you know, of course, it's a bit of a game of chicken with the startups. You know, they're, they're trying to build as much of an audience as possible before they start the content deal discuss discussions with the uh, uh, rights owners. Uh, once they have a healthy user base that they can showcase and sort of used to sweeten up the deals. Uh, but as far as uh, the startup itself, you know, what are your thoughts on Rap Genius, Jay? Uh, we haven't really talked about it on the show much uh, before. So uh, from a fellow New Yorker, you know, wh where is the company at and where do you think it can go? Um, I, I, think, uh, I think Rap Genius is uh, extremely calculated in trying to look uncalculated. Yeah. I think everything that they do is about how to generate publicity. Um, and they very much play up this role of the founders being kind of out on the fringe and crazy and not really know what they're doing. Meanwhile, you know, I think one of them's, you know, they're all from Yale. I think one is Yale Law. You know, these guys are not dumb. 
They know what they're doing. I think they've known exactly what they were doing from the get-go. And and Teresa and Horowitz is not dumb. I think they knew that this was going to have to come to terms of getting licenses from the publishers for the lyrics. Uh, I think the reason that some of this news broke, uh, and then two days later we heard, oh well, they did a they did a deal with Sony ATV earlier this year, so six, eight, nine months ago. I think. It was all, I think, calculated to say, okay, we're not going to say anything about this. We're going to wait until the story starts to build about, uh, you know, how we're unlicensed and how we're all, you know, evil, and then they'll come back and and uh, and try to ride that wave. Yeah, so it's funny, right? Because because uh, Sony TV is part of the NPA as well. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, I think everything they do is with with an eye towards how they get more publicity. Uh, I think the product itself is interesting. Um, I think the fact that just an annotation platform whether it be for rap lyrics or any other lyrics or for news articles or for whatever else, I think that's far more interesting than, than, than all the shit about the founders and, and the focus on, on the lyrics. I think it's much bigger than that. And I think Andreessen Horowitz knows it's much bigger than that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's just the way it started and then it's, it might develop in different, in different ways. Uh, David, have you, are you familiar with Rap Genius? I mean, to be honest, I, 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 I'm very unfamiliar with it just because I, I'm not a massive uh, hip-hop fan. So I haven't really used it uh, more than a couple of times just to check out what it was, really. Uh, you know, but how do you feel about a startup that is based around lyrics? It's, it's quite an interesting take, given that all our other lyrics companies are really based on displaying lyrics and they don't really do much else with it. I'm back. Um, the, the, the other lyric companies, um, the other sites are, are focused on uh, just attracting as much traffic as possible right. and not really give a, f- a, f- a fuck what is on that page or how it looks. And yeah. Yeah, all the advertising is super obtrusive and uh, it's, ju- it's, it's just the basic common denominator of uh, you know, a site trying to get, get any traffic and, and, you know, and abuse it as much as possible. That's like a user so, experience, yeah. Yeah, it's a horrible user experience. So it's great to see a site like this, you know, that is you treating uh, ly- lyrics with the due kind of reverence and, and discussion they should have. But I, I guess uh, lyrics have kind of fallen behind a bit in that in the realms of recorded music, there's been a, there's been so much work done in in licensing, corralling, and presenting these mu- this music properly that now the kind of lyrics have been left behind. We're going through the same process again, kind of with these with lyrics, and they're kind of even words and it should be monetized, you know, and and trying to corral that and, and make that in you know uh, into licensable format and uh, and how and figuring out how lyrics should be used and can be used and manipulated and everything else that's going up. Right. goes along with it um but uh yeah i think it's great but but i've never i've never used this particular service yeah. myself sure. I, don't, I don't have i don't you know i only know about three rap songs probably uh, at all so um and uh I, i'm pretty sure i know the lyrics to most of them and uh so I'm probably right. <laughs> no, I am hardly unqualified to talk about this. Uh, Darren, <laughs> your last thoughts on Rap Genius? <laughs> it's a shocking low level of hip hop <laughs> in this. going on here. On you people. Good God. Should have had Ian Hugger. <laughs> it's good at that. I, no, I, I like it. I mean, but let's face it, this is just like the YouTube model all over again, where, you know, it's probably inconceivable to think back Thing that you know videos at one point were sitting in a weird space post mtv and pre youtube where no one was quite you know uh caring how valuable they were and then youtube has sort of reinstalled that value and i think you know rap genius has every chance of doing the same because it's got the andres and backing and and all of those things but yeah it just feels like the same old mo really doesn't it you know they're not they're not licensed they dodge paying everyone there's a whole posturing and bullshit period where we'll you know, talk about it, and everyone benefits from the PR, and then eventually they do the deal. But I mean, the only thing that made me laugh, to be honest, was that David Lowry had made a huge, you know, thing of of how he was going to unveil this massive game changing kind of assault on a big infringer, and and literally, I mean, it was what three hours. It was kind of like we hate them, and he's like, we've done a deal, and just the whole thing deflated overnight. Um, so that bit kind of made me laugh, but. Yeah. Just because I'm not a very nice person, but um, <laughs> yeah, beyond that, I mean, it's you know, it's yeah, I, I mean, it, it's you know, as Jay said, it's it's 
the uh, you know annotation of content on the web is a is a simple but very excellent idea, uh, and I think it could work well. I think they need to tone down on the you know it's three bros from wherever running the damn thing. Like, I don't care, and I don't think anyone else cares. And having them pull up at events and using rude words just to shock everyone, yeah, whatever. Uh, but no, I mean it's good. You know, it's good that deals are being done. I mean, equally, I suppose it's easy now. The deal has been done to sort of stand there and go, "Hey, great," you know. But uh, you know, it's conceivable that they could have been shut down if it had all gone horribly wrong. Um, yeah. Unlikely, but it's you know not inconceivable. So uh, it's sure. good that it's there, and uh, you know I, I think it's a it's a nice idea, and I think you know it'll it'll carry on growing. So good luck to them. Yeah, exactly. And it's not like they didn't have the money to pay the advances necessary for a publishing deal of that size. You know, they had a 50 million round. You know, publishing advances are not as big as uh, uh, recorded music advances. So uh, I'm sure they would have managed to do that. Um, and finally, I just wanted to, uh, I, I don't know anything about it because literally I haven't seen any clips from it yet. But uh, have, you, have any of you guys have seen anything from the YouTube Music Awards that happened earlier this month? And do you have any yeah. thoughts whatsoever? Was it good? Was it did it involve the community at large? What, what, any comment on that, really? I loved it. You loved it? it? Great. great. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the event itself was a bit like watching The Word, which, I mean, <laughs> Jay, you won't remember this, but it was like a show on Late Night on Channel 4 in the early 90s that was inevitably a massive train wreck. So um, it was a bit like that. But, you know, it's it prone to moments of genius, like the woman from L7 dropping her trousers and Nirvana sort of falling over drunk and all of that. And we all remember them really well. And the YouTube awards were a bit like that. But, but I mean, at its core, what I thought was great was that, um, you know, they, they had this kind of live video concept, I suppose. It's, it's harder to explain than it's just to see, but it's a bit like... They were shooting live a promo video for each song, I suppose is the best way of describing it. Right. And the Arcade Fire one is probably the best example if you were to only look up one of them. Um, and for that, I think it worked very well. And I just thought it was kind of interesting. You know, I mean, they were going to get a kicking anyway, let's be honest. Everyone, everyone had a reason to give them a good kicking. Um, and I quite like the fact that, you know, they could have thrown an unholy amount of money at it and taken on the Grammys for the sheer glitz and silliness, but they didn't. And they made it kind of quirky and weird. And, um, I quite liked it. I thought it was sort of endearing, really. And, you know, it was more interesting than most awards, which were just one big, rather dull, back-slapping fest for people involved. And, you know, you might get the odd good performance, whereas this was actually stuff that you'd want to watch, you know, at least a couple of times. Um, not so much Lady Gaga one. That was just shite. But uh, the rest of it was... Was good. That's good um, to hear. It's good to hear because, like, when they first announced it, they just rolled out all these big names, and we weren't really sure whether it was going to be just a, a big name fest or whether it was going to be more quirky. So it's good to hear that that was the case. And and Jay, it finished in New York City, didn't it? So that that was last stop. Uh, yeah, I saw literally zero seconds of it. So <laughs> I don't so that we're on the same <laughs> we're on the same plane there. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I'm probably uh, you know a generation too old for it. But I mean, I think it's more it's more of an you know it's a more of a, a, a of an attack on MTV than than the Grammys. Right. Um, and, and I you know I think that's that's the right place to be. You know, don't take yourself too seriously. This is YouTube after all. But um, yeah, I didn't see much of of it. I heard people talking about a couple of things, um, and maybe it was just Aaron talking about it. But uh, other than that, I did not. Uh, I, I did not really Too get much, much of it. from yeah, it. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, D- David, have you seen any of that? Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, we'll uh, shamefully conclude the show. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even need to take this off of mute to do this, but no, I didn't really see any of it. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> cool. Well, Darren provided us with a fantastic running commentary of the MTV Awards from earlier this month. <laughs> <laughs> it's inexcusable. It's inexcusable. Yes, I'm, I'm, no, I, I like it. I think the thing is with that, there were so many people looking at it, and oh, it was, it was absolute rubbish. And it's a bit like, well, you're misunderstanding the whole thing. It just it made, I think rubbish. it really it, it delineated between you know the kids of now and how they consume. And you know, I think Jay's right. You know, it, it, he and I certainly. I mean, I think you and DJ are of similar age. Uh, probably are a generation past, and it's only because I'm desperate to be down with the kids that I checked it out. But <laughs> not to know, say too, because I, 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 you know, I don't feel particularly like a, <laughs> like a particular yeah. kinship to this. Uh... <laughs> I liked it. It was it was different. You know, it could have been yeah. a really dire, sterile load of old tur, and it wasn't. It was it was different. And at the moment, I kind of at least applaud them for that. Yeah. It was no, it was it was good. I think there's. Things that they have to realise. I mean, you know, the best video went to a Korean pop group 
Um, and it was quite a mental video. It looked like if I'd eaten too much sugar and then taken LSD, it was like that was the end result. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it was kind of the problem was that when they announced it, I think they announced it in the States and everyone was just like, who the hell is this group? You know, yeah. I'd never heard them. So I think there's kind of a few practical considerations that they can't really do a global thing there because music isn't as global as we all like to pretend it is. You know, yeah. there, there are huge scenes that, that, you know, the UK and the US have no real sight on and things like that. But yeah, sure. no, on, on the whole, I, I, you know, I thought it was really promising. And again, you know, it's the first one, cut them some slack. I mean, the Brit Awards, you know, lest we forget that infamous one with Sam Fox and Mick Fleetwood, where it's, you know, easily the worst award show ever televised, unless Jay can counter with an American. <laughs> So, you know, as opening yeah. gambits go, I thought it was pretty cool. Excellent. Well, uh, we should conclude this, and I promise that next week I will know more things. Uh, <laughs> and I will have at least watched uh, uh, what we're talking about. Uh, but uh, I want to conclude, and I want to uh, ask you guys uh, to plug uh, anything or uh, everything that you're working on. So, uh, David, I guess uh, we haven't, we talked about Good Lizard uh, quite a bit in the previous episodes, but we haven't really mentioned the Signature Brew too much. So if you want to expand on uh, what you guys do there and uh, where people can find that, that'd be great. Cool. So um, I, I, I carry on a, a company that makes beer. I make beer with bands and musicians. Uh, it's called Signature Brew. Um, we just launched a beer with Mastodon, uh, the nice. amazing metal band in awesome. the States. It's an 8.3% double black IPA. Um, and it's available from, well, from signaturebrew.co.uk. Uh, that's it, really. And awesome. um, I'm at David Riley on Twitter. And do you ship internationally? We did. It's quite expensive because we have to put it on a plane. <laughs> sure. um, but you can you can definitely order to the, you can order to any pretty much anywhere in the world. And uh, so you know, if you are in the states and you want a, a very expensive but a very cool uh, Christmas gift, you can order some Mastodon beer. I can sell it better myself. That's perfect. You see. <laughs> and uh, Jay, uh, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, anything you can talk about, or is everything still under wraps? <laughs> Um, you know, always talk about Tomahawk. Um, yeah. I always promise that there's a new version coming, and I, I again promise that um, we've got some big things in the works, and, and uh, so I'm excited about uh, kind of everything that's going on under the hood. But uh, awesome. stay tuned again, and be patient. Uh, more good stuff from Tomahawk coming. Absolutely, and it's uh, you can check out Tomahawk. Uh, is it Tomahawk dot? Uh... It's a uh, get get Tomahawk dot com. Right. And yep. is the uh, right. web web based site. Uh, Darren, uh, for, uh, give us some music uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that you're working that? that you're working with. I guess preferably, but have it, you got any rap, Darren? Know. Apparently, I don't listen to enough of it. Are you are sorry. Have you got any rap? <laughs> yeah, I don't work with any hip hop groups. Although, although, actually, I would say the special request album on uh, Houndstooth is pretty formidable. Particularly if, like me, you're of a certain age and can remember the first wave of really nasty jungle music it's a it's a definite one where in a dark club with 15 inch bass cones you would have some sort of minor religious experience so uh right on the you know on the sort of dance end of things that's that's pretty awesome uh i work with another band superfood who've just put their new single up um uh which is uh called bubbles which is pretty awesome as well that's quite lively uh, and then on the non-music tip, I suppose I should give a nod to AIM because it's the AIM IndieCon Day uh, tomorrow, tomorrow here in London, which um, I'm taking part in. I'm going to be doing a, a presentation on sort of what I've learned of my years in marketing, which is going to be quite <laughs> wow. interesting because uh, I'm not known for my restraint. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's going to be quite good fun. Um, yes. So, yeah, but no, I'm really looking forward to that. There's an A&R panel on it. I can't wait to see who people like. Calder Marshall, who I work with at Infectious, who I think is, you know, one of the finer A and R men in the UK scene. Um, yeah, he's a man who saw, I think he signed Psychic TV in nineteen seventy eight, apparently, which is a fact about him I didn't realise until recently. But uh, but yeah, it's a sort of A and R panel with him and Daniel Miller and various other people, and it should actually be really, really interesting. So um, it's a great lineup. I'm looking forward to that. So yeah, keep an eye out for kind of content stemming from it in the next uh, few days. Great, awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys, for uh, joining today, and thanks so much for listening. Again, you can find uh, the show on digitalmusictrends.com. You can check out the YouTube, SoundCloud, MixCloud, TuneIn, and Spreaker channels too, or find it on iTunes or on most podcasters. You can contact us on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great week, and till next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.